me rephrase that. The same rules regarding electronegativity and shielding still apply. In fact, it's an even bigger effect since we're going from 0 to over 200 than from 0 to like 10 or 12. Okay? But the units are still the same. It's delta and ppms or parts per million. That CDCL3 is just an internal control. You can ignore that one. However, if you look here, this is what? One chloropentane? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, one chloropentane. And you get an individual peak for each of the five carbons. Whereas if we had, if we did just pentane, oh no, let's say, let's say, remember when, when I showed you the fatty acid, it has a lot of CH2 groups in the middle. With those proton, when a lot of times the ones in the middle kind of start to run together. You, you have problems seeing them. Unless you have a really, really, really strong magnet, you'll have problems differentiating them. C13, since it's a bigger spectrum, um, you can. You can differentiate them. So it, it's really, really robust at telling you the number of types of chemically non-equivalent carbons there are. Okay? So this one is easy because it tells you, oh, look, there are five different carbons, and they do go in order in the sense that the one that touches the chlorine... Oh, wait a minute, I've got to change color, which is in black. The one that touches the chlorine will be the furthest downfield. The one that's next to that one comes next. Then C3, C4, and C5. This is C1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So they really do separate out. So that's why it's, it's, it's fairly simple. And that since it tells you the total number of carbons that there are that are chemically unequivalent. Now, if we would have had something that looked like this, let me show you. Oh, not what I was wanting to do. <clears throat> if we had something that looked like this, one, two, three, four, five. So now we have six carbons total, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this would be, you know, like one chloro, four methyl pentane. But how many different signals would we actually see on the C13 NMR? Wait, someone said, I heard someone whispering it. Well, then say it with some conviction. I said five, two, five. You don't see five because two of them are identical. Okay, and so you still have, they still use TMS for zero, by the way. And so this is roughly 200. That's delta, whoops, that's supposed to be delta PPM. Okay, and the reason being is we have this one, which I'm just going to call it A, whoops, A, B, C, D, and this one E. However, the one that's also hanging off of <laughs> number, that number, letter D is also an E. Those are identical. So you'd actually only see five peaks. Okay? And so if you knew the formula, if you were given formulas of C6, CL, C, CL, and see how many H's are there? There's 3, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, H13. But only five signals that tells you that two of the carbons would have to be identical. Okay? And so E would actually be the furthest one down, uh, furthest one, the closest one to the TMS. So E would look something like that. Then, it's a little bit difficult to, to, to tell. Like, I would accept either C coming next or D coming next. They're going to be kind of close. But definitely A and B would be further <coughs> down. Okay, because they are closer to the chlorine. <clears throat> so chances are it goes A, B, C, D, and then E, just the way that we have it, have it written. But you could make, I would accept your argument at this point in time that D, since it's touching three carbons, whereas C is just touching, touching two, could jump ahead. <clears throat> All right. Now, one other thing I wanted to point out is if we go back, let's see, no, there we go. 
is you get a distinct carbon, but look at the integration. You can't do integration with these. The integration doesn't necessarily, it doesn't equal the, the numbers of that type of carbon. Because if you look at those, there's one of each of those type of carbons, but each peak is different. And so we can't integrate like a <coughs> proton NMR. And it doesn't do the J plus one rule like proton NMR. Like you don't see the splitting like that, like the nice splitting, the peaks. So that's why it doesn't tell you as much information as the proton NMR in that sense. Okay, now in theory there is something called J plus one, but it's completely different, and your book doesn't even go into it. I had to learn it, and it was really confusing. And you have to have a very special magnet to get it done, so I'm not even going to go there. So for all intents and purposes, we're just going to be able to tell like how many different types of carbons there are. Is We'll, we'll tell you on the C13 NMR. Okay, and so to summarize, the electronegativity of whatever is attached to the carbon is even more of an effect than it was with the hydrogen. Okay, because instead of going from 0 to 12, we're going from 0 to like 220. And hybridization does affect it a lot. But now there's something that's a little odd. So the sp3, like the carbon that's only touching four other carbons, is going to be really close to the TMS. And the triple bond is going to be further down, but an actual an alkene is even further down a lot of times than a triple bond, especially if there's other carbons hanging off of it. And so I'll show you what I mean in just a moment. Okay, so, yes, I already mentioned that. So don't memorize these numbers, but you would just ex I, did, I would just expect you to understand the rationale. So if a carbon only touches one other carbon, it's going to be really close to the TMS. If it touches two carbons or three carbons, it moves a little further down. Okay, because it gets a little bit more of the, the shielding removed. If it touches four other carbons, same thing. Notice if it's an alkyne versus an alkene. This is a little, little, diff, a, a little different. So the alkyne, you, yes, you have that triple bond, and it does push it further downfield. But it, at most, touches only two carbons, whereas we have this really electron-rich electron double bond. And if it, especially if it touches four other carbons, or if it touches like an oxygen along one of those, it's going to shift it way downfield. Okay. And then anytime you see that benzene ring, it's way down there, getting closer and closer to, to uh, 200. What do you suppose is going to happen if it's a carbon that's double bonded to an oxygen, say like a carboxylic acid, an ester, or an aldehyde or ketone? Is it going to be closer to 200 or closer to the zero? What, definitely. In fact, aldehydes and ketones, especially ketones, are way down there. That's where you can get like over 200 even. And so, and you can see the similar trend of what we've seen in the past, whereas bromine versus chlorine, it goes a little further down. Oxygen is a little further down than chlorine because it's a little bit more electron negative. They don't show you fluorine. But fluorine, in theory, would be a little further down. On the nitro, is it because the nitrogen that's so far down? Well, it's, it's both the nitrogen and the triple bond. Okay. So once again, anytime that you keep adding the bonds and there's a lot of electron density around it, then, then you're not, you're, it's going to be more shielded from the, from the magnet, so it's going to be able to be further down. <clears throat> okay. Then we're going to completely shift into a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that's UV vis, so the ultraviolet invisible spectrum region. You've actually been doing this in biology and in gen chem. I don't think they ever go into a lot of detail about it, but instead of looking at, in the radio frequency, remember NMR is looking at signals in radio frequencies, so it's really, 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 really low energy radio waves. These are higher energy in that sense. Um, but this is, I mean, we see in the visible spectrum, we don't see in the UV spectrum, of course. But this, you know, NMR told you about the spins. This one actually tells you about conjugated pi electron systems, which right now, you may not know, you may not know what that is, but pi electrons are in double and triple bonds, especially double bonds is what we're talking about here. And conjugated means it's going to go something that looks like this, where it goes double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. It's like a benzene ring is a conjugated system. Okay, and we actually have 
couple of chapters at the end of the semester and the beginning of the next semester where we go into a lot of detail about these. But they show up under the UV Viz spectrum, that part of the part of the spectrum, which is really important in vivo, especially because these aromatic conjugate systems make up proteins and they make up DNA and RNA. And so that way you can actually quantify and, and you know measure the amount and see in a sense how much DNA, RNA, or protein is around. Okay? So that's why it's really important in biology. You also use this in color metric systems. Like whenever you do some of the assays, like the Bradford assays and that kind of stuff, we're using the UV vis spectrum. Okay? And so here, the way that you do this, I mean, what they're going to show you here is just one possibility, is you first just do a scan. If you have something that's got a conjugate system, you just scan it in the entire UV vis spectrum, and it's going to have a maximum where that's the maximum wavelength where it absorbs the most energy from that from that spectrum. And that's called lambda max. And that's actually known for proteins and for, for nucleic acid. So for example, the lambda max for tyrosines, especially tryptophans in proteins, which are amino acids, is 280 nanometers. <coughs> it's supposed to be in my good uh, stylus died. It the end finally fell off. And so I got this out of my wife's purse. And it's a freebie that came from the teacher's exchange, but it's a pen that's a stylus also. And so the little part where the pen comes out gets stuck. So it's not the best, but it, it's free. So, But that's for proteins. And for nucleic acids, it's 260 nanometers. And so DNA and RNA, you can quantify at 260 nanometers. That's how we actually determine how much DNA or RNA is in a sample and things like that. So we use this all the time in biochemistry and even in biology and things. Uh, you just said that 280 was an amino acid and 250 was DNA. Mm-hmm. DNA and RNA. Yeah, that's where, that's where they're maximum. And I'll show you what it looks like in just a moment. But on the x-axis is the nanometers, and on the y-axis is going to be how much it gets absorbed by that system. And I apologize, that does not come through. So I'll, draw, I'll try my best to draw it in. I didn't pick the color that came with the stuff in the book. It looks like this. There we go. All right. And so this is 1,3-cyclooctadiene, which in vivo doesn't really... Man, I wish that they would have picked you know, DNA or RNA or something that, that way it's more biologically relevant. I don't know what happened to the axes either. Let me do a different color for the axes. There we go. <laughs> so the other is the whites came through, but I don't know why it's part of it. Didn't. So here we see a maximum, and the maximum for it is 230, for this compound, 230 nanometers. If you do this for DNA or RNA, it'll come up around 260. Depending on the nucleotide, maybe just a little bit, you know, plus or minus 5 nanometers off, but I mean, right around 260. And for tryptophan, especially the tryptophan and tyrosine, it comes up around 280 nanometers. Well, those are conjugated aromatic systems. And so the reason why this is really important comes to something that you learn in gen chem, but I think they usually probably, they just tell you that, you know, oh, this is important. Um, but it's called Beer's Law. And which it has a very, you know, famous name, Beer's Law. It's made fun of a lot in state schools. Um, <laughs> But what, they do, what it does here is that absorbance is equal to epsilon times B times C. And epsilon is called the molar absorptivity coefficient, which you get from this spectrum. That's how much, that's how much it absorbs, okay? It's a, it's a coefficient. And it's based off a of concentration. B is called the path length. It's the length... That we, that's when, if you remember from Gen Chem, you probably use like the big spec 20s where you have to pour it in the big old cuvettes that are like this big, and you pour a whole bunch in there, and a lot of times it was colored. And you'd stick it in the machine, and you see the little needle go up and down, up and down, you know, for absor absorptivity. So it was a path length of that cuvette, which is, you know, one centimeter a lot of times for those spec 20s. And C is concentration, because if you add more in your sample, you're going to get more abs absorption. So the reason why this is such a powerful technique 
is as long as you know the absorptivity coefficient, you can figure out how much you have in your sample based off of its absorption. And so that's why we use it all the time for determining how much DNA or RNA is present or how much protein is present based off of its composition. And so that's all that I was going to, I'm not going to go into a lot more detail. And we won't cover mass spec just because of time. Okay. So that's...